2014, Nigeria had um, Nigeria, along with another, um, with a lot of African countries, faced an Ebola outbreak. Um, and one of the first things we heard about Ebola was that it could be cured by bathing in salt. Um, and I remember that that morning, around four o'clock in the morning, one of my aunties in the village called my sister, who's a medical doctor, and told her she got on WhatsApp a message that she needed to bathe in salt. And my sister was saying, I'm a medical doctor, you cannot cure Ebola with salt. But my aunt said, I'm your aunt, I love you, I don't want you and my, you know, my grandkids to die, you need to bathe in salt, because that's what was spread on WhatsApp. In the same way, a lot of misinformation is spread via these channels. And WhatsApp in Nigeria is particularly, um, it's particularly pre prevalent because it's cheaper to use, um, and you know, and it, it almost transcends illiteracy because people will send videos. You know, and people actually create videos and send, and so people don't need to be literate. Um, these are some of the metrics um, that CITAD gathered in in its research. You know, studying hate speech and its dissemination in Nigeria. From broadcast to media, talking about you know um, how. You have broadcast media in Nigeria, so like radio, television, but then how it spreads to you know, other forms of media, whether it's online, whether it's print, um, and the, the platforms that people have to propagate this um, on wholesome messaging. Um, talking about a, comp a number of political programming you know, with fan pages created not just by the radio stations, but people who are listeners. Um, for instance, Kawane Gauta on Freedom Radio in Kanu. These fan pages generate large volumes of speech. I think it's also important to say here that a number of, a number of um, fans of these radio stations or fans of political programming listen to, this, listen to these programs because they, have, they, they are following a leader. So for instance, the current president of Nigeria, President Muhammadu Buhari, has a large following in the north. And so people who, um, sorry, I made a mistake, has a large, almost cult following in the north. For some people, he's seen as a god. Um, and so people, when, when young people or people who really believe in him listen to these stations, they're not listening to them to take on any alternative information, but they're listening to protect the person they consider to be a god or the person you know, who they follow really closely. So it's really important to keep that at the back of your mind. Um, who are the hate speech makers? They're predominantly males. No surprises there. Educated. <laughs> Um, since they communicate mainly in English and presumably young people because age falsification is common in social media. Over 60% are identifiable commentators, they're partisan, various political parties. Politicians come only second as a category that but audience, but result, as the results show, audience, audiences tend to be more receptive to messages by the politicians. Again, this is because of the patronage system um, that largely um, functions in Nigeria. Um, so here are some examples of, you know, of incidents that have happened. Um, and I think the one I'm going to, you know, just briefly talk about um, was, um, it, or is going to be um, President Jonathan's um, speech when he conceded defeats to the now president, um, Muhammadu Buhari. Um, there was a lot of, I think that the 24 hours between when the results were announced and between Mr. President, um, you know, bet between when we knew for sure that Mr. President was going to concede and to when he actually did must have been one of the most tense periods in Nigeria. This is because anyone who remembers the 2011 elections will remember that when the current president, uh, then aspirant, when he ran and he lost, violence broke out in a lot of places in Nigeria. And so the fear for a number of us, especially people monitoring elections and roving was, if he loses again, violence is going to break out. Um, and he'd, he and a number of his supporters had made a few inciting comments. And so the air was really tense. Um, and you could see, you know, as you look at this, you can see like really um, sharp spikes in, you know, in the amount of hate speech that was um, you know, transmitted during that period. So how does CITAD know that their campaign is succeeding? Um, as you can see, one of the things that CITAD does is they try to counter the, um, these communications. And I think that even citizens by themselves have created mechanisms where they counter this, um, where they counter hate speech, but not just hate speech, where they counter false information with truth. I know that during the 2015 campaigns, a group set up a platform simply to fact check what either, you know, um, what either um, presidential aspirant was saying. From offline to online, a large number of the items um, of, of hate speech are reaction to criticism of specific persons, like I mentioned that earlier. While the criticism itself is not necessarily dangerous speech, 
the reaction tends to qualify as dangerous speech. Quick example, somebody says something about a politician you like, um, that information might be true or it might be false. It's not inciting, but the response to that is almost always inciting. We've also, um, I think, and I, I can speak as someone who works within the you know, civic CSO slash media space, a lot of the times the responses you get um, to criticism of a particular candidate or of a party tend to be personal. They move away from the issue. Or as a matter of fact, they, they move totally away from the issue and they focus on the person. If you're female, the response tends to revolve around a few things. One, um, you know, wardom or prostitution or go and marry or, you know, some threat of physical harm. Um, a number of male friends of mine had their offices, their workplaces contacted to say, this person is speaking against you know, this politician or that person, you should fire this person. So beyond hate speech, sometimes it actually goes into um, actions that could really threaten the lives or careers you know, um, of the people who are offering this criticism. And so tackling or combating online dangerous speech has to take on board more campaign on getting people to not be provoked. I'm smiling because I'm Nigerian and, you know, provocation. Um, <laughs> how, are results shared and, um, how are results shared and used? So CITAD um, organizes meetings um, at the end of every month, a press conference in which, um, in which they share the analysis of results. Um, they also share a brief with, you know, the relevant security agencies, including the National Human Rights Commission. Um, appropriate responses to certain hate speech items have been counted using the same channels. I've mentioned that. What have they learned? A better understanding of the nature of hate speech, a clearer understanding of its channels of propagation, um, and they are, they've been able to identify key moments that generated hate speech, from which they've been able to identify um, key triggers and drivers what to do with the results. Um, allow us to develop more effective strategies for countering hate speech in the country. I think I should stop there and mention the work of another organization called the Northeast Regional Initiative. It's, um, OTI, it's OTI funded. And what they do is counter violent extremism in the Northeast by using other young people who live in the Northeast. So they have a fellows program and these fellows um, hold a lot of tweet chats, hold town hall meetings, hold community um, engagement meetings to speak to their peers because it's more effective than having you know, donors or politicians gather young people in a room and tell them don't fight with each other, don't get indoctrinated, etc. cetera. It's, it's a lot more effective when your peer or your friend is speaking to you and telling you about these things. Um, what else is CITAD using, with, using this result for? It's used to raise awareness and to drive advocacy for both government and to develop appropriate responses to drivers of hate speech and for citizens to not only be engaged in hate speech but also to not be provoked by it. Okay. Um, this is the end of the slide. Um, again, just to apologize on behalf of um, YZ Yao, who was supposed to be here but couldn't be here because of, because of visa issues. I think this also raises the question about you know, reciprocity between countries and how um, the Schengen area can facilitate easier and more effective movement between Africa and Europe. Thank you.